I told Larry today about how I got tried. They tried to throw me off the stage at MIT during a lecture, but I refused to go. <laughs> so it's kind of a, I'm a little bit of a cantankerous character when it comes to the market and its influence over what's being made in art and what's considered to be successful or what's considered to be important art. And my whole point is that history will sort of play it out. So I know that's a long answer, but it's a complicated thing to talk about. Thank you. <laughs> so how do you found, huh? How do you found the production of the pieces? Who's talking to me? Thank you. Oh, <laughs> um, with my own money and with uh, uh, grants and with museums that want to produce work with me. A lot of museums invite me to come and make something. Um, all different ways, all different ways. I just canceled the piece I was telling Larry today because I ran out of money. So it, any way I can, I fund the work. My work is not expensive to make, though. A lot of the things you see look maybe more expensive than they actually are. My budgets are very small, comparatively. And when I don't have any money, I make still lives. So that's why you see a lot of these flower pieces and landscape pieces. They're pieces that cost nothing to make. And my whole point with something like, Bill Viola owed $6 million, Matthew Barney at $3 million. And I was like, yeah, but great art can be made for $10, and I'll do it. And so one of those big flower pieces literally cost me like $25 to make it. And the whole point was that I could make, you know, d d could be debatable, but I can make great art for 25 bucks. And if you can't make really good art with a pencil and a piece of paper, then you're not an artist. So when I have no money, I sort of retreat into making still lives which is what a painter would do. You've got, you can't afford a model, you know, you get a hooker. You can't afford, you know, uh, to, you know, to, no one invites you to paint Napoleon, so you paint a, a, a vase of peonies, right? You paint, you do what you can with what you have. And so I sort of retreat back and forth, you know? How have you seen your work influencing others? Oh, God. <laughs> That's a question, but... Um, do you, have, do you see a lot of art? Are you an artist? or? I'm a poet, but I see a lot of art. Yeah, well, it's kind of hard, you know, particularly as a woman, because a lot of the things I did very... People don't realize I was working in this medium as early as I was and doing a lot of the things I, I did. And um, a lot of the techniques I used have been copped by a lot of artists. And I do them... And it was always this sort of... My argument for my work has always been, I invented certain things. The work, my work has a lot of inventions in it, but the inventions are all because I didn't have any money or because I needed to do something that I didn't, didn't want to do in a way anyone else ever had before. So the filters over the windows, the colored filters, you keep, right before that, uh, it was like 1990 I started doing that. Bill Viola and Gary Hill would just darken everything and make it into a black theater. I didn't want to do that because I wanted art to exist in a museum or an exhibition or some kind of space with other things. I wanted art to exist in the light, but architecture was also part of the art. So I came up with this way of dimming the room but making it referential, right? Ref referencing the color band of video, RGB, all the things that make video and light, blah, blah, blah. So I came up with that way of darkening spaces. I can't even tell you how many times I see it now. But people don't use it for the reasons I used it. You know, the reasons I used it were very complicated, and I've written about them quite a bit. Um, the flower piece that I made, the chrysanthemum piece, where I wiped out the video rectangle. If you notice, that piece just looked like it was made out of flowers. That's, people are starting to do that now. But I finally wised up, and I made like 50 of those, because I wanted to like stamp them. You know, it's like, you know, like, Ellsworth Kelly didn't make one blue panel, you know, he made like 50 or 60 or something. You just like stick your name on everything. So once people start, so now people make that with, they make images with a black field around it and then you set, put, put a certain amount of light in the room and the field disappears. So the image takes the shape of the thing, right? So that was that piece. And then I just invented something else. I was really into my latest invention and I can't remember what it was, but I'm gonna keep using it, whatever it is, until somebody steals it, but the point is that I'll use it so much that everybody will know it's mine before it gets stolen. But yes, it's like, every, you'll see a lot of that stuff. And the way I use the architecture. People, you know, before that, obviously people just project images on walls, right? I projected images on walls for a reason. You know, they were supposed to wrap, they were supposed to be about time and space. So you're supposed to not only be conscious of the image, but the space with, uh, that the image occupies. 
So the images wrap and they move and you move through them and with them. And a lot of artists do that now, but they don't have the reasons that I had for doing it. So you see a lot of um, work that sort of riffs off of bits of what I do, but none of it kind of as this kind of complete package and also as a, a trajectory of ideas. I'm talking too much. Sure. No, it's called I Like America and America Likes Me. That's it. Yes. <laughs> um, but in that piece, I think it's interesting because the artist is investing in his body mm -hmm. with an animal that is wild, not a captive animal or a trained animal. It actually was. It was actually someone's pet, yes. <laughs> and he borrowed him. <laughs> it's voice. It doesn't matter. It's a symbol that matters. <laughs> Absolutely. Whereas, you know, he's flying out from Germany and he's felt blanket, you know, not sitting where he is, and he's flying the course. And then he goes into his apartment in New York, he's there with a hungry coyote. Right. You know, but if you think of that sort of civilizes, you know, the capitalism versus, you know, Germany, full blown right now. Yes, it's uh, yeah. Okay, if at all, yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's my whole life. You know, I mean, my I have, um, which I'll talk about tomorrow in class. I do have a whole political agenda, and I am an activist, and I make film for organizations that deal with endangered animals, endangered species. But in my artwork, I don't. It's not didactic in that way. It's not overtly political in that way. And, but I work almost entirely with endangered species, with uh, animals, uh, um, um, abused animals, rescued animals, all kinds of animals. But the whole point um, of them and of me working with them is about this, is this question of subjectivity and objectivity. Point being, though, is when you think or you spend that much time watching these tigers from all these perspectives and all these points of views, and you finally realize that one of them is blind, and yet you can't, she's so well adapted to her environment that she, you can't tell the difference between her and the other tigers, blah, blah, blah. You start to become invested in their subjectivity. It's not a film of them, it's kind of a film with them. That's the whole point of my work, the, the wolves as well. And that gets back to your question about the Deleuze and Guattari, about the becoming animal, and where Deleuze and Guattari talk about um, that a wolf is never one, it's always multiple. A wolf is always a pack. A wolf is never a single animal. So that piece had to do with making the single wolf multiple, but multiplying him with a camera. The tigers, uh, I just worked with western lowland gorillas. I go to sort of far off places to work with endangered species to talk about not only um, the beauty of them, the loss of them, um, the rarity of them, but it's the rarity of them and the beauty of them that gives them their particular kind of value in filmmaking. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, I could make work with a house cat. I have made work with a house cat. But um, when someone sees essentially a, a species like a tiger, they have something invested in tiger nests. Do you know what I mean? So it, they, it comes with something tied to it, and, uh, and I use that thing to, to build on. I use their aura or their nature or whatever it is, the, the way in which we see them to build off of them. But they're almost always very rare creatures, endangered creatures, blah, blah, blah. So yes, I would seek them out specifically. And I talk about, um, in my political work, obviously, I talk about endangered animals and species, blah, 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 global warming, et cetera, mass, mass extinction, which is happening now. We're in the period of mass extinctions. But my whole point as an artist is that you could save the monarch butterfly because they're part of an ecosystem, because of this, because of that, because they do all kinds of things. But why not save them because they're beautiful? <laughs> why not save them because they give, they, 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 without them the world would be less beautiful. And that's kind of a political statement in and of itself, you know. But